please. Okay, great. So uh, this is what I'm going to do in this presentation. I'm going to introduce the descriptivist tradition and its leading representative by my lights, Ernst Mach, uh, talk a little bit about its major idea and the ideas that this description, uh, that this tradition opposed, uh, look at its initiating event, distinguish between different kinds of descriptivism, only one of which is Mach's. And I'm going to focus on the notion of explanation looking at Mach's two ways of allowing for that notion. If we have time, I'll talk a little bit about the relation between descriptivism and instrumentalism. Um, and finally, I'll definitely do some initial evaluation of Mach's descriptivism and explain why it's important to the anti-realist tradition. So I guess if, if you were asked to name some empiricist or anti-realist positions in philosophy of science from the 19th and early 20th century, uh, we'd each be able to list things like instrumentalism, conventionalism, fictionalism, um, and then talk about the logical empiricists and stuff like that. But descriptivism might not feature on your list. And I think it probably should do because it is, it seems to me, of some historical importance. So what was it? Well, it was from the mid 19th century onwards, a tradition in philosophy of science. Its initial positive idea was that mechanics can be construed as a purely descriptive science. And this idea got developed by Mach into the idea that science as a whole is a descriptive enterprise guided by considerations of economy. So the task of science is conceived of as finding the most economical description of the facts in question. There are in the literature various treatments of this position. The two canonical ones, I think, are by Ernest Nagel in his 1961 book, The Structure of Science, and by Alan Musgrave in an article from 1977. And I'm going to follow the latter more closely for reasons that will emerge. Musgrave takes descriptivism to be the view that as he puts it, scientific theories, excuse me. Scientific theories enable us to describe precisely how things happen, but cannot really explain why they happen as they do. So he takes descriptivists to be hostile to the notion of explanation, contrasting that with description. So who was a descriptivist? Musgrave in that uh, article strangely doesn't say, he doesn't identify anybody as a descriptivist. I'm going to say that the central figure was Ernst Mach. Um, so Mach uh, was um, in his scientific career, was initially very much uh, an experimentalist. So the subjects that he investigated included the Doppler effect, measurement of blood pressure, acoustics, the phenomena we now call Mach uh, bands, motion perception, and shock waves. From his experiments on the latter, shock waves during the 1870s and 80s, we now derive several items of physical terminology, including our way of referring to the speed of sound. So this is Mach, uh, pictured here very shortly before he invented the twin blade razor, of course. But why do I say that descriptivism was a tradition and who else was involved? Well, Mach definitely thought of himself as standing within a tradition, or rather he thought of himself as having initiated it, actually. He mentions several other people in this exact connection. So the Scottish engineer Rankine, the um, British mathematician Clifford, the German scientist Kirchhoff, uh, Karl Pearson, the statistician, and Pierre Duhem. And of course, in his, apart from Duhem in his strange way, all these figures count as empiricists. And the tradition didn't even die out with Mach or even in the early 20th century. There are later examples, such as followers of Mach, such as Philip Jourdain, and people like the mathematician E.W. Hobson, and notably, um, and strangely, given his uh, critique of Mach in his first book, uh, 
the logical positivist Moritz Schlick. So what did descriptivism oppose? Well, its insistence that science, that science was descriptive was usually ranged against one or more of the following. Um, claims that science involves discovering causes, claims that science involves explanation, the idea that laws of nature are prescriptions, the idea that science introduces ineliminable hypotheses. I've already said I'm going to talk mainly about explanation in this presentation, and that's principally for reasons of the time constraint. But to start with, it's useful to see what Gustav Kirchhoff had to say, because um, what he wrote in his lectures on mathematical physics at the very, the very beginning in their preface is something of an initiating event for descriptivism, even though Mach thought that he had the idea first. So Kirchhoff starts these lectures by urging that mechanics doesn't or shouldn't try to determine causes because of what he calls an unclarity of which the concepts of cause and striving cannot be liberated. An unclarity which is exhibited in the diversity of views on whether the principle of inertia and the principle of the parallelogram of forces are to be regarded as the results of experience, as axioms, or as propositions that can be proven logically and need to be proven. So he immediately goes on to say, it seems to me to be desirable to remove obscurities from mechanics, even if this is only possible by restricting its task. For this reason, I present it as the task of mechanics to describe the movements that take place in nature and to describe them completely and in the simplest possible way. What I mean by this is that it should only be a question of specifying which phenomena are taking place, not of determining their causes. And that is from Kirchhoff all we get, that's the totality of his descriptivist view. It's confined to mechanics and it stems from a worry about the status of mechanical principles, which if you think about it is very close to the one that Heinrich Hertz uh, expressed uh, several years later in 1894 in his book on the principles of mechanics. Now, two, days, two decades later than Kirchhoff's words, Mach knew that they had not carried the day, since, as he put it, much had been found wanting in them that had always been regarded as an essential element of scientific knowledge. What can mere description accomplish? What has become of explanation of our insight into the causal connection of things? But Mach did not waver from the descriptivism that Kirchhoff had sketched, and in fact, Mach is a much better example of a descriptivist than Kirchhoff. He was fully committed to the view, as Kirchhoff probably wasn't, and he applied it across all science. So science for Mach is a matter of describing facts and relations between facts. How then did he reply to these queries about um, explanation and insight? Well, we'll see. First, recall, though, that Musgrave treats the descriptivist as having failed to realize that scientific theories aren't merely descriptive, but also explanatory. And he argues convincingly, I think, that theories do both explain and describe, even though what they explain is not what they describe. But the first thing to say about uh, descriptivism of Marx's kind is that it is notably less extreme than what Musgrave has in mind. It does not really feature this uh, anti-explanatory component, right? There are some passages of Mach where it sounds as if he is saying that science involves no explanation, but I don't think that is his uh, considered view, right? In fact, the idea that we explain by describing is Mach's idea. And so now we see why Musgrave didn't give Mach as an example of a descriptivist. He constructed the position in such a way that Mach doesn't count. And in fact, Musgrave uh, 
thinks that Mach was not a descriptivist, but an instrumentalist. On his, on his um, account of these matters, those positions are inconsistent with one another. You can't be both. So I'm going to call what Musgrave has in mind anti-explanatory descriptivism. Some other descriptivists might be good examples of that, but Mach wasn't. And in fact, gen descriptivists generally tended to allow that science does explain. And they did so via two converging routes. So on the one hand, descriptivists sometimes thought of explanation as description. Um, so for example, uh, Mach says things like this, a so-called causal explanation is nothing more than the statement or description of an actual fact or of a connection between facts. And again, people who have not made a special study of physics always believe that they broaden the basis and increase the profundity of their thought if they assume a fundamental difference between a scientific description, for example, of the development of an embryo, and a physical explanation. And finally, um, when Newton gives a causal explanation of planetary motions by showing that one particle of mass m acquires through another particle m prime the acceleration phi given by that equation, and the acceleration determined in the first particle by different particles are summed geometrically, he is only pointing out, sorry, or describing facts which, although by a roundabout path, have yet been reached by observation. So that's the general idea, but Mach's view when he laid it out in most detail was actually that explanation is a special kind of description. That is a description as he puts it in terms of elements. Now the word elements there is um, a bit of a flag at this point. Um, if you know a little bit about Mach, you might be thinking um, our element is his word for sensations and thus suppose that what's in question here is a kind of empiricist foundationalism, the kind of thing that gets called sensationalism. Um, but that's not what's going on. Those elements, the ones discussed in the, the notorious first chapter of uh, the analysis of sensations, are the commensuration basis for the communication he insists is needed between physics and psychology. And they aren't really sensations in the purely psychological sense that philosophers prefer. My paper in the Interpreting Mach volume is about that. Mach is not best thought of as a sensationalist in any case, I would argue. Even here in the analysis of sensations, in his account of explanation as description, the elements are not of that kind. He calls them elements of mass and elements of time and says that they're related by differential equations. Elsewhere, before he started using the language of elements entirely, he stressed that the simplest and most fundamental units he had in mind are not fixed in the way that elements of sensation would be, but are instead determined by custom and history. So an example of that is that quotation there from his early book, History and Root of the Principle of Conservation of Work. In this second way of putting the matter, which I think is the more basic and important one in Mach's case, descriptivists allowed that science explains by thinking of explanation as what I'm calling decomposition. So here's what Mach says. Beside the collection of as many facts as possible in a synoptical form, natural science has yet another problem, which is also economical in nature. It has to resolve the more complicated facts into as few and as simple ones as possible. This we call explaining. Right? These simplest facts to which we reduce the more complicated ones are always unintelligible in themselves. That is to say, they're not further resolvable. An example of this is the fact that one mass imparts an acceleration to another. It's not the only place in which Mach, supposedly somebody who rejects the idea that science is explanatory, uh, 
tells us what explanation is, and indeed in a little bit of detail. Now, Musgrave contends that anti-explanatory views actually rest on uh, what he identifies as a subjective conception of explanation, familiar from common sense and ordinary language, in which explaining something is merely a matter of removing puzzlement about it. So he thinks that this conception, as he puts it, lies at the root of the demand that a genuine explanation must somehow be ultimate. In other words, that it's the, the factor common to, on the one hand, essentialism, which accepts the demand and argues that science satisfies it, and on the other hand, to anti-explanatory views, which reject the demand and conclude that science doesn't explain. But Mach's conception of explanation is just not of this kind at all. Firstly, Although Mach thinks of what we resolve the facts into as de uh, depending on convenience, custom, and history, he's not making the mistake of presenting explanation as what Mus Musgrave calls a person-relative affair. His approach is more scientifically inspired than that, more a matter of approaching the idea of explanation using the idea of decomposition or reduction, which was familiar to him from physical science itself. And second, of course, since the reduction is to something that Mach tells us is unintelligible in itself, Mach cannot possibly have thought of it as a matter of removing puzzlement. Doesn't make sense. So far, I've presented Mach as a descriptivist, but the usual way of thinking about Mach, of course, is as an instrumentalist. Indeed, Mach's name is the first name that most of us would come up with if asked for an example of an instrumentalist. Um, and, of course, there are different ways of being an instrumentalist. And as long as one defines instrumentalism in a broad enough way, uh, Mach will count, okay? But uh, for purposes of this paper, because I'm critiquing Musgrave, I want to look at whether Mach is rightly thought of as an instrumentalist in the way that the Popperians think about instrumentalism, right? So Popper, like lots of others, identifies Mach as an instrumentalist. And in this 1977 paper, Musgrave carefully does not do so, right? His only example of an instrumentalist there is Pierre Duhem. But in other papers, Musgrave does count Mach as an instrumentalist along with Duhem. So let's ask, how does, do descriptivism and instrumentalism differ? In Musgrave's formulation, where the descriptivist makes one error, the instrumentalist actually makes two. So as well as treating theories as purely descriptive, not explanatory, the instrumentalist also moves from the idea that we can never be certain that any scientific theory is a true description of the world to the conclusion that scientific theories are not true or false descriptions at all. This is what I'll call semantic instrumentalism. It's the kind of instrumentalism whose advocates have taken the linguistic turn and whose USP is that scientific theories or laws or hypotheses are neither true nor false, right? So in 20th century philosophy of science, this was the distinctive instrumentalist doctrine. If we, if we focus on something that's uh, relatively specific rather than, for example, the way, the way in which uh, pragmatists use the term instrumentalism. There are better candidates for instrumentalists of this kind. For example, uh, Wittgenstein himself and Schlick after he got over his descriptivist phase. Um, and also the figures that Musgrave elsewhere identifies as Wittgensteinian instrumentalists. But let's ask ourselves, was Mach an instrumentalist in this semantic sense? In particular, did he subscribe to the idea that scientific theories are not capable of taking truth values? And did he make the mistake that Musgrave identifies? Uh, 
In order to clinch the first part of the case, I at least would want to find Mach saying that some important components of science, theories, hypotheses, laws, or just statements are neither true nor false. But actually, he he pretty much doesn't say anything like that, I think. It's hard to see him as a semantic instrumentalist, in fact, because he doesn't really have the machinery that's needed for that position. He's not only prior to the linguistic turn, he's also pre fregean And so he's not much focused on issues about meaning or truth slash falsity at all. So my view is that when it comes to Mach, Musgrave, and also in fact Nagel, load instrumentalism with too much of the semantic baggage that Wittgenstein and logical empiricism su subsequently supplied. And therefore that Mach is not a good example of an instrumentalist. So now let's ask the question, what should we think now of descriptivism? How should we evaluate it? In my view, anti-explanatory descriptivism is of little to no interest. Uh, maybe this is just a personal comment, but I can't take seriously the idea that science doesn't issue in explanations. I, I, I wouldn't see the point of the concept of explanation if science doesn't supply not only examples, but indeed our paradigms in certain ways. Marx's explanatory version of descriptivism won't work either. I think there's no doubt about that. There is one paper, surprisingly by Brian Ellis, which defends this kind of descriptivism by um, arguing that explanations of processes can be descriptions of a certain kind. But in general, explaining is not describing, and explanations are answers to why questions, whereas descriptions are not typically uh, answers to why questions. They can be, but only under pretty special circumstances. And decompositions into elements aren't answers to why questions either. They might answer some scientific questions, such as what is questions, but not, I think, why questions. Can anything be said in favor of descriptivism though? Well, it is a more modest form of anti-realism than semantic instrumentalism is, right? It doesn't commit the fallacy that semantic instrumentalists are alleged to commit, that is conflating truth with certainty. And despite being unsatisfactory, ultimately, Marx's descriptivism is important as an example of an anti-realism that is trying to take explanation seriously. And the existence of such an anti-realism is itself important, important because it shows how the framework within which, within which Musgrave is working, despite having various virtues, um, distorts matters ultimately. So Musgrave's framework cannot recognize the difference between his own modest realism, as he calls it, and explanatory descriptivism. They actually collapse into the same position on his framework. But it also commits the anti-realist to being anti-explanatory from the very off. Why does it do so? Well, uh, here I conjecture that it does so because Musgrave is working within a framework that's been established by Popper. So Popper had explicitly argued in that um, 1957 article, The Aim of Science, that only realism could account for scientific explanation. Right? So he says, uh, the task of science, which I've suggested is to find satisfactory explanations, can hardly be understood if we're not realists. And if you remember that article, the reason he thinks that is because he thinks that uh, no non-realist can uh, cope with the notion of discovery and depth, which are needed to explicate the notion of explanation. Marx's perspective, which I think has been persistently misinterpreted by Popperians up until very, very recently, I have to say, is an indication that this is not so, right? Of course, 
an anti-realist does have to come up with an account of explanation. But the idea that they can't do, can't even try to do so from the off because it is, is somehow uh, structurally prohibited is, I think, derogatory. So in the last uh, minute or two, I just turned to some conclusions. Um, Nagel and Musgrave were right to identify descriptivism as an important historic empiricist position in the philosophy of science. Mach is widely reputed to be an instrumentalist. And indeed, in one of my publications, I've argued that in one area, he does count as such, right? So what he says about laws of nature um, eventually does get around to looking pretty much like semantic instrumentalism, okay? But this is not how Marx saw the matter, right? Although the term descriptivism wasn't coined yet, he would have thought of himself as a descriptivist. Descriptivism was a more modest version of anti-realism than instrumentalism, and it wasn't always or constitutively anti-explanatory. Max version featured at least two attempts to portray science as explanatory. And in this respect, I have to say that Marx's view is, uh, by my lights, more reasonable than, for example, Duhem's form of anti-realism. Uh, these are some references to, to works that I've referred to that are not uh, works by Mach, but I'm going to take my last uh, minute to uh, advertise this book, which uh, I'm, I've just edited this book called Interpreting Mach. Um, as Antonis mentioned, uh, Thomas Ubel has a paper in this volume, and there are various uh, other papers by all these illustrious figures, as well as me, and um, I I think I won't hesitate to say this is the latest volume published uh, by, uh, on Ernst Mach because it was only published last week. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Uh, okay, so we will use the first five minutes for questions from students and then we'll open to everyone. So like Karim said before, uh, type Q for